So this is going to be a series about going to be an introduction to PCBs, so printed circuit boards. Printed circuit boards are important in the electrified universe that we live in. Printed circuit boards are very important at, for an engineer to understand and be able to utilize in their career. All right, so we're going to look at some terminology first, and then we're going to also going to look at Eagle and how Eagle, the the PCB production software, helps us out. We're going to look at how we use Eagle to make PCBs eventually. But first we're going to start with terminology and this is going to be a, a broken down into these major concepts that you see here. Right? So we're going to talk about PCB con concepts and, con and definitions in this video and then there will be other videos that talk about how to get Eagle. There's going to be videos about how to use libraries inside of Eagle. We're going to look at the schematic board and the schematic and board view inside of Eagle. We're also going to talk about design rules for Eagle and then we're going to look at how we route and board layout inside of Eagle. Right, so if you follow this series from start to finish, you'll be able to take your concept from the drawing on the page where you've done your math and you've done your electrical layout all the way up to an actual physical printed PCB. So let's look at PCBs and let's talk about what they are as a conceptual product, right? So PCBs are fundamental to electri electricity. They, they are simply a circuit board that has been printed. So instead of having to wire all of the connections that we want together, we've made a process, we've gone through the process of making a device that holds all of those connections in a very, very compact form. Right Before the advent of the PCB, we had to literally wire in all the points that we wanted to have access to inside of a circuit. When there's wires, wires lead to failure. All right, so you can fail at a junction, you can get a short circuit where two wires that aren't supposed to touch, touch each other and when insulation begins to age and crack. Right? Not only that, simple programs had need for miles of wires. And it also put physical limitations on the size of storage that we could have. When we have wires, you have to have a certain size for a certain voltage because of physics. So there is a physical limitation to the amount of current and amount of energy that you can put through wires. Not the same amount as you can through what we have now with PCBs and, and traces. So we can get much, much higher voltage much closer together with a PCB, which we couldn't physically get with a wire. For instance, um, everybody always talks about the fact that, oh, you have more computing power in your pocket than they took to the moon. Well, this is a picture of the Apollo guidance computer. Right? Notice there's a ne rat's nest of wires behind these little panels, right? You can see them up at the top. You can see the wires going, snaking through that panel. Each one of those wires was something very specific. It was going from one point to another point, and it caused, it was a concern in space. The concern for a short wire, the concern for a spark in a very high oxygenated in atmosphere, when you have no where to go other than that small capsule, is a big problem. Just ask the crew of Apollo 13. They had big problems with this. The other thing that, that you can take note of here is in order to change the programming, you would literally have to physically rewire the structure. The program is literally wired into the structure. And this was a this was a major issue for Apollo. Even in Apollo 11, they had some problems with the programming and had to bypass and, and certain there's certain steps and procedures that they had to do when landing. And it was a very, other than, you know, landing being very scary, it was also a little bit of added pressure that uh, they were under because of how they were wired and because there was actually a short in one of the wires in one of the in one of the panel boards that they had to bypass right so wiring as a whole while very useful is not perfect it doesn't always lead to perfect success this needed to change there was a need for change as electronics moved at first it moved to vacuum tubes and relays but then we realized that silicone and we could do silicone and we could get transistors and all of this transistive technology that we have now with integrated circuits right the size and cost of electronic components began to go down electronics really began to become more of a consumer good. And because consumers are trying to buy it, you want the cheapest possible with the best longevity, hopefully. Right? So size and manufacturing costs of electronic products drove manufacturers to better solutions. And this is where the PCB really entered into its own right. right? Now, I, I keep saying PCB. PCB is an acronym. It means printed circuit board. Right? So it is a board that has connections via lines or pads and those connect various elements of the electronic circuit together. You traces, trace out the electric path. The, the signal that is routed 
around the physical devices does so in paths. And then you can solder on electrical components, electrical connections, right? So if you need a resistor, if you need a transistor, whatever you need in that electrical component, as an electrical component, you can physically solder it in place. And so soldering is the metal that makes up those electrical components. The reason that we use solder, specifically tin solder, is because tin is a metal. Metal is strong. We've seen it before. Right? So it conducts electricity and it has some ductility so that you can kind of, you don't have to really worry about the fact that it's going to break off, pieces are going to come off. That solder being metal gives us that mechanical adhesiveness. When we're looking at a PCB, there's a bunch of different things that make up a PCB. Right? There's some terminology that we need to talk about specifically in its construction. A PCB is a, a composite material. Right? A PCB is we can look at it like a cake or like a lasagna. There's alternating layers of different materials, and they're all squished together, and then with heat and adhesives, they, all, they become fused into a single object. Here we see kind of the layers. If we look at it sideways and zoomed in on it with the microscope, we'd see that there are layers to it. There's the layer on the silk screen. There's something called solder masking. There's a layer of copper. Then there's a layer of substrate, and then usually another layer of copper, right? There can be more layers than this. There can be, um, there can't be fewer because this is the minimum, but there can definitely be more. There could be the substrate that we see here, the substrate in this case, the green part in the middle, is something called FR4, right? So FR4 is fiberglass. FR4 is a designation of fiberglass. It's a very specific type of fiberglass. This is why PCBs are thick and rigid. You can create a PCB that's not FR4 based, that is bendable, Right? So if you need if you need certain properties, you can change the substrate. Most of the PCBs that we that you will deal with though do have sub uh, do have a substrate of, of fiberglass. It's fiberglass reinforced. Right, so that FR means it's reinforced, fiberglass reinforced. PCBs can be different thicknesses. Most commonly, they're about a one and a half millimeters, one point six millimeters. Some of them are thinner. You can get product. You can get a half size PCB that's about 0 0.8 millimeters thick. Some of them are thicker. The cheaper PCBs and perf boards that you may have encountered and you may have soldered with if you solder a lot of different products don't use fiberglass in their materials because fiberglass even though it's very inexpensive to us on a bulk level manufacturing level it, it could get it could be a expense in order to reduce the cost they've gone with other other substrates specifically some sorts of epoxies and other devices right they don't really last as long as fiberglass FR4 boards do, though. But they are less expensive. So, I mean, if cost is the only decision, then less expensive PCBs are available. When you're working with PCBs that are not that are not fiberglass reinforced, though, they tend to be very hard to solder. And they often give off a very, very acrid, bad smell, right? And that's due to the fact that the low thermal and properties of, you know, of the epoxies that they're using are actually decomposing as you bring them to temperature in order to solder. Right? So you can you can smoke it and smoke the board, you can cause it to char, and if you hold the iron on too long, you can put holes through these boards. Right? So there are different manufacturers, different types of PCBs, but most of what you're going to run into is fiberglass reinforced, and FR4 is a very solid PCB. The next thing that we saw in that layer was we saw that there's a very thin layer of copper. So there's a thin copper foil layer. Then that is laminated to the top of the, the fiberglass reinforcing material or the substrate that you're using. And this is where you're going to mill your paths and your, and your channels for electricity. On double-sided uh, PCBs, copper is applied to both sides of the substrate. Sometimes you only get copper on the top side if you want to, you know, if you have a, if you don't really need the bottom and you don't want to have that extra cost of copper. It may not look expensive to us because it's only, you know, less than a penny, but in bulk, that's very expensive. When we refer to a double-sided or two-layer board, right, that's the number of copper layers, two in this case. You can have one, you can have as many as 16, but you can't have less than one. You need at least one, but you can have many, many more. There are boards that have 16 layers of copper for, for you know, very specific purposes. The copper thickness also can vary. And copper, remember, is a metal that is very ductile. It can be squished down very thin, right? It is very conductive, second or third only to the gold and silver, which we don't use because it's gold and silver. And copper's, you know, much, much less expensive per ounce. But copper is has that same ductility. It can be, you can compress, you can beat copper down, you can push it out and squeeze it till it's almost an atom thick, right? So you can get very, very thin copper. The copper thickness that you get on a PCB board varies, though, and it varies by weight, right? So the way that you get copper weight is it has a density. Density is the value per square foot. So most PCB boards have one ounce of copper per square foot. 
but some can have more. So the density dictates the amount of copper that you get per square foot. Some PCBs have one ounce per square foot of copper. Some PCBs that have need for the large for larger channels and vias and and uh, routes has two or three ounces of copper per square foot. Right. This is usually what we refer to as a pour. Right. So each square foot of of copper translates to about 35 micrometers or a ten thousandth of an inch. Right? So one ten thousandth of an inch, give or take, is about how thick you're going to have copper on there for every ounce per square meter. The number of ounces per square meter usually is how we refer to what we call a pour. Right? So if, you've ever, if you hear that it's a one ounce pour or a two ounce pour, it's one ounce per square foot or two ounces per square foot. Above the copper, we have something called a solder mask. Right? The layer that is on top of the copper we put there, it's a solder mask. It is there to make sure that the copper doesn't doesn't patina, right? So when copper ages, if you leave copper out in the sun in the in the weather, it will develop a layer. It's like rust, but it's not rust because it's copper, so it's patina. Well, patina isn't conductive, so it would it would change the conductivity. So solder mask is laid over, it's overlaid in onto the copper to insulate the copper from contact with other metals even. You don't want just anything to be able to touch across your channels, your vias, your lines, the things that you're putting in there, because that's why you're putting them in there, right? You don't put electrical wires, just bare electrical wires against the ground. You have them insulated. Same concept here. We're putting solder mask over there to insulate it, right? Solder mask can be universally colored, but most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, I'd say it comes in green and it is covering up small traces. You mill in the small traces and then it covers them up. It leaves, if you if done correctly, it leaves a spot where there's a little bit of copper exposed for surface mounted components or to solder to. Solder mask masks the copper from soldering. On top of the solder mask, you can do what's called a silk screen, right? So silk screen, just like when you're printing a t-shirt, you silk screen on top of the copper mask to get some get some more information in there, right? Here we see silk screen, it's the white part of this that says power in 330, right? So it's telling us that that's the power inlet and that there's a 330 ohm, probably 330 ohm resistor that runs between these two silver pads, right? So silk screening, we add letters, we can add numbers, we can add symbols, makes our PCB look professional. And again, silk screening can come in any color, but again, 90% of the time it's white. Okay, so that's the basic idea of a PCB. That's the, the structures that we have. But let's talk about other terms that we might hear that, that deal with a PCB, but not necessarily structurally, right? So we have things called annular rings. Right, so an annular ring is that space around a plated hole in a PCB. Right, so here are the annular rings. We see that box on the, the silk screen box. The annular rings are right next to it. That would be where you would stick a through hole object and then solder it to the other side. We have stuff called drill hits. Drill hits are that lace where we want the drill to be. Right, so drill hits are where we want the drill to be. And then inaccurate drill hits are caused by dull bits. So if your bit is going dull when you're milling or if you're drilling, very common for large industrials to have duller bits. You'll run into inaccurate drill hits a lot if you start looking at PCVs, right? So, uh, so a drill hit is that, that space where there's designed to be a hole. Right? We have something called fingers. Fingers are where we have metal pads exposed along the edge of a board. If you upgrade your computer and you use memory, if you upgrade your memory in your computer to speed up your computer a little bit, those gold sections are fingers. Right Here we have a micro SD that has fingers on the back of it. We also have pads. Pads are a portion of exposed metal on the surface of a copper board that we could solder stuff on. Pads are where we're going to solder surface mounting components usually, but they can be on the back and it can be for a through hole. Okay. So a spot where you can see uh, metal and your that is designed to be there, that is a pad. When we are making uh, surface mounting components, we do something called paste stenciling. So we get a thin piece of metal and then the, the design for the board is cut into it so that we can smear over a paste in order to have the area where it is cut open deposit a specific amount of solder. Right? So solder paste is smeared in there. This person is going through the process of pasting that stencil and he's smearing the solder paste into that stencil and where you see the yellow, not the metal, is where the solder will stay when he pulls the, when he pulls the stencil away. Uh, there's also a machine called pick and place. It is a machine that is by its comp by components places components on circuit boards, right? So it will process a circuit board and place the components where they need to be. When we talk about a pour, we talk about something called a plane, right? So a plane is the continuous block of copper 
where we don't have it doesn't touch the edge, but it is bounded more by by paths by by traces. This is this is what we're talking about when we talk about how thick the pore is or how much pore there is. Again, two pore is so many ounces of copper per area. So the thicker your pore, the thicker your plane. Right? The deeper you can cut the grooves, the wider you can cut the grooves, the more energy you can get through those paths, those traces. Plated through holes. Right? So with a hole in a board that has an annular ring and is plated all the way through the board. Plated through holes are used as a connection for through hole objects. They're also used to make what's called a via, and they're also used as mounting holes, right? So it doesn't necessarily need to be a object like here we see a mounting hole and we see a through hole resistor, right? So you see the resistor sticking up on top of the board and then over to the over to the resistor's left you see a hole in the board that is plated. You can tell it's plated because it's silver in color and then also it is. It doesn't have any other purpose other than to mount that board to hold it against either the wall or whatever you're connecting it to. Right. So you can have plated through holes are just holes that have been plated all the way through, and they can be used to connect components. They can be used as channels, as vias, and they can also be used to mount things. There's a device called a pogo pin. It's a little spring-loaded device that is used to make connections for testing to see if you have a short in your PCB somewhere. You would use this in the processing after you figure out that your PCB is not correct. You would use this to figure out where PCB has failed. Right? When you are soldering, we have a very specific word for that. It's called reflow. Reflow is melting the solder, creating those joints between pads and components. Reflow is used to melt the solder, usually as a one big board, right? So reflowing is the soldering of uh, devices to a PCB, right? Solder paste is what we use when we do reflow soldering, right? So solder paste is small balls of solder suspended in a gel. And then when you heat it up in the reflow, it will melt, the gel will vaporize away. Left with that solder, it makes that electrical connection. Solder jumpers, if you hand solder and you get a small blob of solder and it connects two pins, that may be a design it may be an error. So solder jumpers could be something that is needed to connect two pins together, or it could be a cause of shorts, short circuits. So if you connect two pins that are not supposed to be connected together, you are shorting your circuit. That's happening through a solder jumper, usually. And then we have um, surface mount components. So surface mounting components is a construction method where the components are set on the board and then they don't have holes passing through the board. It's all on the top of the board or the bottom of the board, depending on the orientation of the board. And then it is surface mounted by reflowing the solder, right? So you solder paste and then you reflow and then your device, your components are stuck down. Um, this is the dominant method of assembly in today's manufacturing because it can be easily computer controlled and it's very, very efficient, very quick. On your on your board, you'll have a space called a thermal. A thermal is a small little space that has been designed to allow that energy, that heat, to get into the solder to be able to quickly solder objects together, components onto the board. Improperly thermally relieved pads, they don't really take solder very well, and it takes a long time to heat the solder up to get it to stick. So it's, it, it'll feel different if you've improperly thermally relieved your pads. When we talk about our board, we've used the word trace. A trace is just a continuous path of copper. Right? So here we see two different types of traces. It's the outline, the darker green section, is where the trace is outlined. That light green section inside the dark green section is actually the trace. Right? So the outline is where you milled out the copper, and the trace is what's left. Right? So we see a very thin trace coming from the reset, and then we see a thicker trace coming from that 5 volt pin. Right? So whatever that is, the thinner trace doesn't carry as much current. That thick trace does carries more current than the thin trace, right? Uh, another type of thing that we will see on some boards is a via. A via is simply a hole that is passing signal from one layer to another, right? There's two types of vias. There's something called a tinted via, which is covered by solder mask, and then there's an untinted via. Well, so untinted vias are left there so that they can be soldered on easily to add, um, you know, certain devices to those channels, right? So untinted vias are not covered in solder mask and tinted vias are. And then this picture is actually the front and back of the same PCB showing you a tinted via. Right? So you've got that tinted via going from the top to the bottom. So those are some of the words that we are going to run into, going to encounter on a uh, regular basis when we start to talk more about uh, PCBs. Right? So those are some terms and concepts of the PCB. The next uh, video that we're going to do is actually going to be all about 
Eagle and how we design and how well we're going to start with how we download Eagle and how we get the Eagle and then what libraries are and we'll look at how we design them and then we will be able to start routing and finish our design for our boards right so I will see you in another video